Okay. <laughs> um, it takes a tremendous breaking. And those who have been broken understand that. Um, there's different levels of breaking. And if you haven't been broken, which I'm not suggesting any in this, anybody in this room hasn't, but I want to say that if you call yourself a Christian and you've not been broken, get yourself a tall glass of water and a Bible, put your seatbelt on, because it's all part of the process. And it will happen. It's not something to be feared. It's how, it's what you do with it. Right? Um, so today I want to talk about compassion. Right? We, 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 we hear the word compassion. When I hear the word compassion, I'm, my mind automatically goes to Christ. I just, I don't know if it was the first time I ever heard that word, learned that word. It was in the context of what Christ did on the cross and stuff. So every time I hear that, that's where my mind goes. But we look at compassion, and there's sometimes that we, we do things and respond to things, and we call it something but it's maybe not quite that. And, and I think compassion can be one of those. And I'll explain. So, as defined by the Webster 1828 Dictionary, compassion, a suffering with another, painful sympathy, sensation of sorrow excited by the distress or misfortune of another, or very plainly, pity. So what is compassion? Compassion is a mixed, it's, it's a mix of passion compounded with love and sorrow. Think about that. It shows up in the Bible, the word compassion shows up in the Bible 40 times. And the first times it's, it's used is in Exodus 6. And this is uh, Pharaoh's daughter is when she finds Moses, right? So then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, and her maidens walked along the riverside. Excuse me. When she saw the ark in the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. And when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, a baby wept. So she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrew children. Now, who knows why Moses was in that river in the first place? There was an entire generation being slaughtered. By, ordered by this woman's father. Right? So the first time it's used in the Bible is described to use a situation that is life and death. I mean, there's, there's only two options for this baby right now. And if, if compassion was not on this woman, then the child's fate was sealed. This baby was ordered to be murdered, but instead, within the heart of Pharaoh's daughter, passion was compounded with love and sorrow. And as a result, a woman took on the burden of somebody else. You see, she didn't just pull that baby out of the river. She pulled the baby into her home. She made that baby hers for a long time. That moment wasn't just a passing phase. That was a commitment that she made. That's compassion. The first time it shows up in the New Testament is Matthew 9.35. It said, And Jesus went about all the cities and the villages, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. And when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion. He was moved with compassion for them, for they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Now, imagine a people that are weary and weak and scattered, having no shepherd. What does a shepherd symbolize? Direction. They have no direction. 
So when I'm hearing this, if I had to sum up the condition of those people in one word, maybe two, brokenhearted. He saw brokenhearted people, and he was moved with compassion on them. Imagine Jesus. He's doing all this work. He's preaching. He's healing. And then he sees these people that are broken, beaten, emotionally. Like, we're talking like... And, and maybe the people that, that he was looking at, maybe, maybe they were wearing clean clothes. Maybe they, were, maybe they had good jobs. We don't, we don't know. You know we, we know he ministered to the poor. But again, we, 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 we tend to lean towards financially poor. You know? But there's, there's worse poverty than that. There's emotional poverty. I remember a couple years ago, I can't remember who it was, but there was a, a football player. It was a football player who he killed his wife. Then he went to the stadium and killed himself. And that was, man, that was a long time ago. Anyway, I remember watching the news clip, and it was, I was in like Kmart or Walmart or something, and, and the TV was, they were playing the, the you know, the, the TVs that are for sale, they have stuff playing on them. And I read that headline, and you know how when you watch the news, they keep showing the same clip over and it's looped, you know? Well, I saw this guy's Bentley being loaded on a flatbed and driving away out of the winding parking lot, going to the main road, because it was now in police custody, it was evidence. And I remember seeing that Bentley being towed away, and I thought, there are people that would give anything to be able to drive a Bentley. The, the financial, uh, the provision that you would have to have to be able to afford a Bentley, like this guy had it all. He had it all. And how did his story end with that car being towed away on the back of another vehicle? Why? Well, because there was damage, there was brokenness. I have to keep putting my password in, sorry. I have an iPad. So I've arrived as a pastor, so. <laughs> it's not my iPad, though. Um, so 1 Peter 3, the word shows up again, and it gives us a directive now. It's not being used to describe something. It's being used to tell us how to apply it. It says, finally, all of you, be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love his brothers. Be tender-hearted and courteous. So we can see what compassion is. We can see what compassion is supposed to look like. But do we know how to apply compassion? Do we have compassion in us? And the thing that we are applying and we're calling compassion, is it? Is it compassion? Are you moved with compassion, or are you just compassionate? Because I think there's a difference. Because let's say you're driving down the road, and you see an elderly couple who has a flat tire, and it's raining. And as you drive by, there's, a, there's a, a, something in your heart is like, oh, man. I feel bad for those people. And then you turn your radio up and keep driving. Were you compassionate for them? Yeah, I think, I, I think that's safe to say, but were you moved to compassion? Because being moved to compassion would be pulling your car over, getting out, putting them in a warm, dry vehicle while you change their tire in the pouring rain. Because... In that moment, your strength, you might be feeling like, you know what, I don't like being cold and wet, but I woke up this morning, I had a good breakfast, I'm, I have energy, like, that's not going to wreck my day if I spend 20 minutes in the rain and do this, but I don't know their condition. I'm going to bear their burden this time because I know I can handle the cold, wet rain, but I'm not so sure if they can at the moment. So you take the time out of your life 
and you take on somebody else's burden. Does that make sense? But when you're constantly moving in compassion, I mean, we're called to be compassionate people. I mean, that's a given, right? When you're moving in that, it's easy to grow weary. Because taking on the responsibility, walking alongside of somebody, it becomes weighty. It becomes a burden. Right? And this may not apply to everybody, but when you dedicate your life to helping people, we need to be careful that we don't become the problem. How can you do that? What do you mean? Like, I'm helping people. How can I be the problem? Well, if you lose your compassion, you may not realize it. And now you're not moving out of compassion, you're moving out of kind of a sense of duty. Complacency kills the experienced. I'm going to revisit that phrase in a little bit. When you deal with people day in and day out, you begin to see a pattern of human behavior, whether it's their hurts or shortcomings. You begin to see this, these repetitions. Even though everybody's different, you'll see these repetitions. And eventually, um, you can just kind of burn out. And I was... I actually looked up a, a study uh, among first responders, and this is a huge problem within the medical field of nurses, f firefighters, EMTs. They're burnt out because their whole existence is to help other people. And when you're constantly surrounded by that, you start to go numb towards that. They call it burnout. I worked with some Burnout paramedics. <laughs> and I was, I was a burnout at one point. Really was a burnout. Um, and as Christians, we, we desire to share truth with people. We desire to, um, to want to help the people that have fallen down. Like that, That's our calling, right? We're supposed to bring truth into situations. We're supposed to bring hope. We're supposed to bring the love of Christ in a situation. So like, everybody in this room, you're basically spiritual nurses, spiritual medics. You're spiritual physicians. And you, you, you've got to be careful of, of where you're positioning, your, where, you're, uh, where your advice, where you're your knowledge is coming from. You see a friend or a family member going through a difficult time or something that immediately stirs in you and you're like, I want to help this person. Like you see what's happening and you're so excited to share God's love and say, hey, we should get together. We should talk. And as they start talking, you're getting hit with scripture after scripture after scripture. And as they're talking about their problems, you're seeing the word of God come alive in you of like, oh man, oh, I know what they need. And then it, it finally comes, you sit down, you talk. And as they're pulling out their life to you, you're sitting there with bated breath to share your infinite wisdom of the scriptures. And you're going to change this person's life in just a couple of words. And when you finally dispense this knowledge, and you've said everything the Word of God has to say about this situation, and you deliver it flawlessly, and you hit every single bullet point of truth and Scripture and God's love and healing, And they don't get it. It doesn't sink in. You don't see a change in them. 
you see them struggle with the same thing a month later. So you say to yourself, all right, let's be honest here. Rome wasn't built in a day, right? So you go back at it. And they make a little progress, and they're right on the cusp of breakthrough, and you can see it. You can see it right in front of them. And you're like, no, look, it's right here. And it just, it's just, they're just not getting it. And a few more times you see a little progress, and then what starts to happen, right? We reason with ourselves, well, you know what this person needs to get over the line? A little bit of tough love. It's at this point, it's at this moment that I urge you to pause. Time out. Check your heart. Because this is a defining moment for you as a truth speaker. Because it's here that something rises up inside of us and it says, oh man, the answers are right in this book. Why aren't you getting it? I keep looking at, at, at Kevin. I'm, I'm not coming at you, homie. Sorry. <laughs> I just keep looking over at you. Um, like, you know, like, everything you need for freedom and deliverance, it's right here in black and white and in, in red. <laughs> it's right there. So we're like, all right. I got to do something. Now, we go from being spiritual physicians to spiritual hitmen. So what happens, right? We fill our squirt bottle up with holy water. We start wrapping our crosses with hockey tape. We go get that 40-pound family Bible. And we like, hey, have a seat. Frankie, put them in the trunk. We're taking them to church. And in your mind, it's like, that's what they needed. But have you ever been whipped with a cross? Have you ever been shoved in the trunk of a car? Yeah. Figuratively? <laughs> <laughs> Won't go there. Um, and you're sitting there, and you're thinking, well, they're stuck. They need to get out of there. But what if they're not stuck? What if they're placed? What if you're fighting against God himself in a situation? Now, does that make the word of God wrong? No, absolutely not. And even now, I'm sure there's some people that are hearing me say this. And they're saying, people tend to feel sorry for themselves. People tend to, to get stuck in a rut. And they need to not be victims. They're, they're victorious in Christ. You need to be a conqueror. You're the head, not the tail. Is that wrong? Not at all. That's absolutely right. Absolutely right. But I would say that people who throw a pity party for themselves, people who always want attention, people who are always looking for that word or, or that, that they're chasing that, that high, as we would call it. it. I think they're the exception. I don't think they're the rule. Because Christ came for the brokenhearted. He came for that person. It's listed in his, in his job description of why he came. Being emotionally paralyzed is a very real thing. Very real. And we need to learn to recognize what injuries look like. From the outside looking in, it's virtually impossible to see spiritual scars. It's hard to look at somebody and see heartbreak. Especially if they've lived in that condition their whole life. Because they're good at hiding it.
I need to ask God at that moment. We need discernment. We need to discern, like, what is it in this moment that this person needs? And not base it off of how we feel. We can't base it off of the last person we talked to who was going through the same thing. We tend to do that as Christians. And we talk about the tough love. And I'll tell you what, I am the biggest culprit the biggest violator of that whole tough love thing, because that's how I was raised. And I'd like to think I've gotten a little softer. We'll see. <laughs> I'm sure there's situations that are going to come. I was not raised in a compassionate environment. That doesn't mean I wasn't, loved, I wasn't raised in a loving environment. I think half the reason why I, I'm not as messed up as I should be is because I knew there was love in my family. It's true. Because after my father would wreck the house and put hands on me, splinter furniture, I would see him go off in the corner. He'd be by himself. He wouldn't say too much. But then that night, when I was laying in bed, I give up. <laughs> All right. I'm not going to hold it together, so just get over it. All right. Um, he would come into my room, and he would, he would get down on his knees at, at, at the side of my bed, and he would just hold me. <laughs> Wouldn't say anything. Father never told me sorry once. But I felt his love. But I didn't know compassion. So I would say more often than not, tough love is a result of us growing weary while we're walking a storm with somebody. We don't want to be there anymore. We're tired of this conversation. We're tired of this topic. And we're thinking to ourselves, let's go. Come on. Now, I will acknowledge there, there are times where somebody, they need a push. They need somebody to say, hey, get up. Let's move. If you want to call that tough love, okay. There is a place for that. But I feel like we use it way more often than it's needed. Why? Well, I think it's because compassion has started to die inside of us. If you move outside of God's timing, even towards the perceived healing that you think, you might be calling, causing more damage in somebody. And over time, as you deal with more people, more and more people, it's easy to listen to somebody talk and you stop hearing what they're saying and you're just waiting for a break in the conversation so that you could say what's on your mind. You're not even listening to them. You're just like, I know what the problem is. I know what the answer is. I'm just going to patiently wait because a good listener will wait and let them talk. And then they're done talking and now you unload the Word of God on them. But people's problems they're not cookie-cutter answers. People's fingerprints aren't even the same. If I held this finger up and I say, what is this? Everybody in here recognizes this as a thumb. Everybody has one, I hope. And if you don't, I apologize. <laughs> Everybody's supposed to have one of these. And if you don't, I'm still on that. Okay. So, my point is that you recognize what this is. I can look across the room and I can see Jesse's thumb. Good thumb, Jesse. But if I don't go and examine that up close and look at the fingerprint, because it's different. 
Because there's no two of them that are the same in this room. So what makes you think if somebody's thumb isn't the same that their problems would be? Even if their problems look like another problem you saw one time. So what makes you think you can com even compare to what somebody else is going through with what somebody else went through or what yourself went through? Now that will help you relate to people, but you've got to dig deeper. And you say, well, the answer is always Jesus, right? Yes. But even if in the same scenario, excuse me, within the same scenario, you've got two people. Both of them grew up in broken homes. Both of them were abused. Both of them, their fathers left. Everything about them is the same, but there's a dynamic there that's nothing alike. We need to become spiritual triage nurses. Oh, excuse me. I burped again. Right in the microphone. Um, sorry out there in TV land on your, mic on your headphones. <laughs> um, different injuries call for different remedies. Any patient that goes to, an, to, a, to a hospital goes and sees the triage nurse. Okay? And they're usually the meanest nurses there. Followed shortly behind the charge nurse. Um, no, that's not always true. <laughs> There's some really nice nurses in the room. Um, but, so you bring, uh, I'm, I'm gonna, this is going to be from the perspective of, of what I did for over 13 years. So you bring a patient into the, in the room, and I can give them the symptoms of the person. This is what they called for. This is what we did. This is what we found. The triage nurse is going to take what we said, depending on the hospital, <laughs> and they're going to do their own triage. And they're going to say, okay, this, 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 and this. They're higher level trained. And they notice, oh, you know, they have an elevated P wave or something like that on their EKG. It changes everything. You know, it's not a stomach ache anymore. It's not back pain. This is a heart issue, heart attack issue. It's like, okay, time out. But like I've seen this before, it's a back pain. Everything about this shows me back pain, but no, there's something different here. We have to treat it as such. Complacency kills the experience, right? When I was in the medical field, I was really sought after by my peers because of how well I could deal with drunk, crazy people. Maybe we just can see eye to eye and we relate. <laughs> but I was really good with drunk people. Drunk people, they get drunk and they want to fight. And I could tell you so many stories of like, you know, the cops roll up to a scene like six deep. They got nightsticks out, and this guy's cornered in the room, and he's got a folding chair. And I come peeking through the cops, and I walk up to the guy who's threatening to kill everybody in the room. And I'm like, hey, hold on a second, man. And I just start talking to him like I'm not even there. Excuse me, I've got to get something out of the drawer here. And it, like, is so defeating for them because I wasn't meeting their aggression. I was just like, yeah, do your thing, man. I've just i got to get something out of this drawer real quick. And I built a rapport with the person. And then, next thing you know, you know, I have a folding chair, too, and I'm yelling at the cops. Get out of here, blah, blah, you know, and then the, the door, this actually happens. Door closes, and I'm in there alone with the guy, and we're talking, and next thing you know, the guy's eating out of the palm of my hand, you know. I call it an anointing, call it just crazy, recognizes crazy. But I went to a call one time. It was a Friday night, and there was a lady who was probably in her mid-twenties. She was paralyzed. She, she was in a wheelchair. She was in a wheelchair van. And she was laying in the van, out of her wheelchair, acting a fool. And her mom was there. And we show up on scene, and I walked in, and there was a bottle of champagne, a, 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 like a, one of those, I don't even know why these exist, but there was a bottle of champagne like this big in the back with a bunch of balloons and party stuff. And she's laying on the ground, and she's doing this thing. 
So I start laughing. All right, you know, so my partner, I'm trying to help her out. And the mom seems really concerned. The mom's her caretaker because this woman's, like I said, paralyzed. And I can smell her breath. And man, this girl had a lot to drink, right? She, was, she had a lot to drink. And I said, all right, and we're going to help her up. So we're trying to help her up, and she's falling, and she's grabbing my face, and she's saying inappropriate things to my partner. And so we get her in the wheelchair, and it's an electric wheelchair. And she gets up to the, the, the wheelchair ramp into her house, and she's in the, the, the transition between the porch and the doorway to her house. And she's got the joystick, and she's just clobbering the door jam. <laughs> And I'm trying not to crack up because this is hysterical, you know. And the mother is, like, really drained, and I'm over there. And my partner is trying to get the control of the joystick from her, but he's getting his fingers caught in the door jam. And, this, and we're all laughing, right? And I looked over while I'm talking to the mother, and I saw a glucometer sitting on the end stand. Now, if you don't know what a glucometer is, it's measure glucose, blood sugar. And it was in a little black zip, zipper bag. And I stopped and I said to the mother, are you diabetic? She goes, no, my daughter is. And I went, uh-oh. Now let me break that down, what that means to the unacquainted. When you get drunk, when alcohol goes in your body, you act dumb. You starve your, 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 you starve your brain of oxygen, you starve of, of water. Your, your brain, I've heard that your brain shrinks a little bit. It certainly would make sense from things I've seen and have done personally. But if you have a lot to drink, you can smell it on somebody's breath. It's called ketoacidosis. Well, if somebody's blood sugar is super high, you can smell it on their breath, and you can't tell the difference between if they just drank a fifth of vodka or their blood glucose is in the 400s. So I went, uh, Jimmy. And I went like this, and he was like, we were trying to put this girl in bed for the night, sleep it off. That's all we were there. We were just going to help the mom get her in the bed, and we were going to go home. I treated her like every other drunk person I saw, because all the signs were there. It was Friday night. There were party favors in the van. There was a bottle of alcohol in the van. Nobody mentioned anything about her being diabetic, but I should have asked the question. I'm trained to ask that question. That's the first thing you want to check off. What is her past medical history? When someone's glucometer says hi, it's not greeting you. Like, what a nice little glucometer. <laughs> There's a problem, and it needs to be treated, not like a drunk person. It needs to be treated. They need insulin. They need, there's a whole regimen that you need to do for them. But because I treated her, based on my last experience with the last drunk person, I could have killed that woman because of my own complacency. Fortunately, that didn't happen. So we look at things like myocardial infarction versus cardiac arrest, a mild MI, okay? Myocardial infarction, you got oxygen is starved to the heart itself, and the heart isn't functioning properly. Cardiac arrest means the heart isn't functioning. You treat them differently. You don't give someone CPR that is in, uh, that's having a mild MI. You might have to get ready to do that. You might have to anticipate it. Respiratory distress versus respiratory arrest. Well, both of them are difficulty breathing. One is difficulty, one's not breathing, which I think is the same as being difficulty breathing. But if someone's like shortness of breath, you're not trying to intubate them. <laughs> Hold still, you know. A sprain versus a break, you know. Heartbreak versus heartache. Someone has heartbreak, that's when you're like, listen, you need to get up, dust yourself off a little bit, move forward. But when someone's heartbroken, 
You can't treat them like that. You can't. A number of years ago, I'm, I'm an anecdotal speaker, if you haven't figured that out. A number of years ago, I was rock climbing. And uh, I didn't have any equipment. I was just free climbing. And I kind of sort of might have fallen a little bit and broke my foot. My sister was there. And uh, I landed, and it was like instantly my foot was on fire. Like I, I was just... And I was like, I think my foot's broken. And my sister said to me, if your foot was broken, you'd know it. You'd be screaming your head off right now. And I was like, okay. She played sports a lot. And, I mean, my sister could break a bone playing ping pong. She's a very competitive individual. So I was like, all right. So I got up, and I'm just like, man, this hurts to walk on. This hurts. And she says, the only thing you can do for a sprain is just walk it off. And I was like, I'm pretty sure my foot's broken. Like, it hurts. And she's like, you'd be rolling around on the ground screaming. If it was. So I woke up the next day, and I was like, man, this, all right, you know, I got to walk it off. So, like, I'm deliberately, like, I got to walk this off, right? <laughs> Two weeks went by, and I had to basically be carried to a hospital. And I'll never forget the doctor's face when he looked at my x-ray. He was like, how long have you been walking on this? I was like, a week. He's like, your foot's broken. I was like, you know, that makes sense. <laughs> so they put a cast in it. And my sister was like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I said, Whatever. <laughs> I, I know not to listen to you when it comes to orthopedic advice now. <laughs> but they put a cast on me. And it took the healing process a little longer. And honestly, for years after that, like if the weather changed or, or the... The barometric pressure, whatever you want to call it, just it, it would hurt. Now, had I sprained my foot, you can't use that as an excuse to be paralyzed the rest of your life. You can't walk around the rest of your life saying, no, I sprained my foot. Like, you have to move on. You have to get over it, right? So I'm not giving permission for people to sit there and feel sorry for themselves. I'm not giving permission. This isn't an invitation for you to stay where you're at. Because right now I'm not talking to the people who are in that position. I'm talking to the people who are trying to help someone out of that position. There's plenty of stuff that you can learn about people who are in that position. But a, a person's road to healing is, should, shouldn't be based upon your patience level. And we throw the term Tough love around too often. Another quick story. How are we doing? So I was a kid, right? I was riding my bike. And I got the pedal of the bike. I don't even know how I did it. It passed my leg, and I got my foot wedged between the pedal and the frame of the bike. And I was barely even moving. And I just kind of fell over. And I was like, oh. And it was, the pain was unbelievable. And the way I was laying, that leg was closest to the ground. I had it pinched. So what did I do? I called for my dad. Hey, dad. Now, I didn't know this, but my dad watched me fall over. He saw it happen. He didn't see what happened. And I called my dad, and I'm not exaggerating, for over an hour, calling for help. And finally, my dad responded out of frustration. This kid is being dramatic. So he comes walking out, and he stops, and he goes, what's the matter, son? And I said, well, father... My foot is trapped. <laughs> no. He picked the bike off of me and threw it. And guess what? I went with the bicycle. <laughs> and my dad was like, oh! <laughs> and, I mean, obviously he felt bad about that. But if he would have just been a little compassionate at first, why are you being dramatic? A little di Any dialogue would have been great. But no. And then he realized what happened, and my dad, he got my foot free. Right? But do you know what I learned in that moment? That when I'm hurt, I don't call dad. That's true. We can laugh at that, but what father wouldn't want their child to come to them when they're hurting? But because of that, 
because he based that off of every other time, which, don't get me wrong, I'm not a father. I, and, you know, I could probably paint my father to be a very rough guy, but if you knew me when I was a kid, it might be like, okay, that makes sense. But sometimes we go through things, and it doesn't end until something is accomplished in them, which is why I said maybe they were placed there. So when I've gone, so, and, and some of the advice that I've gotten over the years through some of my worst struggles, at my lowest point, some of the advice I got, I think hurt me more. Because I kept thinking, like, I must be broken. There must be something I'm doing wrong. And I, and I would pray, and I would seek God, and I couldn't shake these feelings, and I couldn't shake this weight and this struggle that I was in. And... I just felt more and more broken. I felt more and more hopeless. Nothing worked. Now, does that mean that the Bible is broken? No. Does that mean that the advice that I was given was not biblically sound? No. It was a different season. And I'm not saying the one who's hurting doesn't have responsibilities. What I'm, what I'm saying is, <laughs> Hold on. I'm simply saying maybe God is just doing a deeper work in them than you can see. And he's going to do it in his timing, not yours. Now I'm going to say, I'm going to say a, a, a verse here, and I want, I want everyone to, to finish this for me. Um, whom the sun sets free... Say it again. Whom the sun sets free. Okay. Can you do me a favor? Put up John 8.36. Now, is that what you just said? No. Therefore, if the sun set makes you free, you shall be free. That speaks of process. I remember I was going through some, probably one of the diff most difficult times in my life. And Coop. <laughs> there it is. <clears throat> one of the most powerful things anybody ever said to me was nothing. There was nothing he could say. We had talked many times. But I remember I was at my absolute lowest. And all Coop did, and those of you who know Coop, know, and those of you who don't, <laughs> I'm sorry that you're missing out. All he did was just hug me. But it wasn't like a hey hug. It was a healing hug. He knew what he was doing. There were no words spoken. Didn't have to say anything. He said more in that hug than all the advice I had gotten through the entire ordeal. Would you mind pulling out a calculator, Melissa? <clears throat> I was never good at math in school. But the one thing I've learned over the years is that math, math is true. It's almost an absolute truth, I mean, outside of the Word of God, because as long as you follow the math correctly, the answer is always predetermined. You can't stray from it. And if it's wrong, you're wrong, not the math. Melissa, would you please add 6 plus 1 and tell me the answer? Say it loud. 7, okay. Now I want you to take 6,748 and divide it by 964. What's the answer? Oh, do 
do me a favor. Put in 8,000, 800,000, 70, hold on, let me back up. 875,000. Times that by four. What is it? Divide that by 500,000 for me. Really? It's interesting. So the answer is seven, right? All the hurting people in the world need to get to seven. We know that. But we're all starting with different numbers. There's always different math equations to get there. The Word of God is always the answer. But we need to know how to apply it to that situation. When you look at Navy SEALs in BUDS training, I know people use this all the time. They're getting beat up. They're in the worst conditions. They're getting yelled at, screamed at. There's nothing they can do to save them from the next thing that's coming. Because it's not about a punishment. It's about a breaking. It's about making something better than when they stepped in. There's no a bit of advice. There's nothing you can tell them to do that's going to be like, you know what, training's going to be a cakewalk from here out. Because that's not what it's designed for. The only way they can get out of that is to quit or finish. That's the only way. And there's a lot of people in the world that are going through stuff. They're not quitters, but they need to finish. So what do we do in the process? Because they're training for something much greater. And we can't talk about suffering without talking about the book of Job, right? And look at his friends. His friends were applying the word of God. We know this. We've, this is probably, this point has been beat to death. His friends weren't lying in what they were saying. Everything they said was true. But they weren't applying it right. And finally, God dealt with Job. God was pretty harsh with him. I think the only like, blatant sarcasm in the Bible, I think, is when God's talking to Job. <laughs> oh, okay, so you were there. When I filled the heavens with snow, right? Gotcha. Okay. But he also rebuked Job's friends. Character doesn't come out when you're strong. Your character only shows itself when you're weak. When Jesus had compassion on the 5,000, he purposed in his heart to feed them. Guess what? The disciples that did that, they were already hungry. Before the work even started, they were hungry. And because their heart was wrong, twice this happened. They were still complaining. They got to be part of that miracle twice, but their heart wasn't in the right place. They were ministering to a broken, hurt people. It's okay to be burnt out. We're human. But we have to recognize burnout, and we have to be proactive with it. You see somebody going through something, and you're like, I know what that problem is. I've seen it a hundred times. I know what to do. We're more inclined to pull people out of a situation than we are to just walk through it with them. We try to pull them, and they're not quite coming, so we result, uh, uh, so we, we, we reason that they just want attention, they're just this, they're just that, so we'll just leave them to their own devices. Matthew 5.41 says, Whoever compels you to go a mile, go with him two miles. Yeah, you could probably come up. Daniel 3.19. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? We just heard about this. We know the story. Everybody knows the story of that, right? Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury, and the expression on his face changed towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than they had usually heated it. And he commanded certain men of valor in his army to, to, to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 
and cast them into the fiery furnace. And these men were bound in their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and their outer garments. And they were cast in the midst of the furnace. And it says they fell down in the midst of the furnace. And what happened? Someone went and grabbed them and pulled them out of the fire? No. Somebody picked them up and stood in the fire with them. And what's interesting is that the only, they only came out of the furnace because the one who threw them in called them out. But they didn't come out because the Bible, it says right here that their, their clothes, their skin, nothing on them was burnt. They didn't even smell of smoke. But you know what it doesn't talk about? It doesn't talk about their bonds. They were in that fire long enough for their restraints to be burned off of them. Then they were called out. But, somebody walked through the fire with them. <clears throat> I've been beaten up. I was hit in the face with a baseball bat. I got beat down with a golf club one time. I hit myself directly in the shin with a 28-ounce E-swing hammer, the claw end. You were there for that. <laughs> I never had anybody in my life that I could be emotionally vulnerable to. But I can tell you what I needed for healing was not tough love. It was just love. Because I didn't know what love was. I didn't know what compassion was if it wasn't delivered with a backhand. Even if it was like, hey, stay out of the road. Even if it was joking. I didn't understand peace. One of the calls that I was on that stuck out the most to me was uh, a guy, he had been gunned down in the street. He was a, he was a gangbanger. He got, he got shot. And I rolled up, and there was some stuff that happened. I, I ended up being the first one on scene, which was bad news. Usually the cops need to be there first. It just happened. But because of a mix-up in communication, I rolled up on the street, and there's this guy laying in the middle of the road. And I could see him in the and kind of the, the way the, the, the mist kind of raises off the warm pavement on a, on a hot summer night. And, and in the headlights, I could see the man laying there in the street. And I looked at him, and we were, the, they were on the radio telling us to get out of there because the cops weren't there yet. And I looked at my partner like, are we going to leave this guy? Nope. So I ignored the radio call. I got out. I ran up to him. And I don't want to get graphic with you, but he was, he was pretty bad. Uh, he, he'd gotten shot six times in the chest. And I drug him to the sidewalk because he was literally in the middle of the road. And at that moment, all that man's life decisions, every wrong he did, every bad decision he made, didn't matter. I didn't care how he got to where he was right then. What I cared about was trying to save his life. And there was nothing I could do for him. And I remember he looked at me. And he said, 
I'm sorry. And then he looked and he said, am I going to die? And I honestly didn't know the answer. But in that moment, the only thing I had to offer that kid was compassion. I would even say I might have even froze a little bit because of the emotion of the moment. He didn't need me to throw in his face how the gang life is, the street life is, is just, you're here because of your actions. Believe me, as he lay dying on that dare, the doorstep, he knew that. I, I, he didn't, I didn't have to tell him that. We're supposed to minister to people from a position of victory. Our experiences, the things we've gone through, and we overcome, is what allows us to do that. That's our testimony. But we have to be careful that we're not ministering out of our hurt to people. Just plain, just, I don't have time for this. You know. Now, again, if, if that's where you're at, then you need to take a step back. You need to go get right with God. I'm not saying push through, and, and I'm not getting down on, on you. I'm simply saying... Check your heart and make sure that the residue of past hurts within yourselves isn't spilling over into your ministry. I'm simply saying be mindful of the advice that you administer because it'll be a powerful thing. And if you are broken, if you are hurting, if you've been abandoned, it's okay. It's all right. And if you're trying to get up and, and it's, it's not working very well, that's okay too. Hopefully now, there'll be people that can recognize that and walk in the fire with you. That's my prayer.